So now we know confounding variables are a problem. The question is what to do about it. So um, the first thing you want to do is to be aware of all the potential. So you want to identify all the risk factors for a disease that are also associated with the exposure. So now we're going to use the example uh, of physical activity and the relationship between physical activity and myocardial infarction. So cigarette smoking is one confounding variable. It is a risk factor for MI and may be associated with physical activity in that the more you exercise, the less likely you are to smoke. Healthy diet's another potential confounder. It's associated with reduced risk of MI and um, it's probably more likely that people who are very physically active eat a healthy diet. Another confounding variable might be uh, gender or sex because um, male gender was associated with increased risk of MI at least until a certain age in middle-aged people um, and also is associated with higher levels of physical activity. Finally, income is another potential confounding variable. It's associated with um, higher income associated with lower MI risk and with higher physical activity. So here are four potential confounding variables for the relationship between physical activity and myocardial infarction. So when we start to try to figure out the relationship between physical activity and myocardial infarction, we start with a situation like this, where we have a whole bunch of different people. Some of them are physically active and some are not, and they also vary um, in other characteristics too. Um, and depicted here are the confounding variables that we talked about before. So we've got income. Some of them are rich, some are poor, some eat well, um, some don't, some smoke, and some are men and some are women. So the first thing we want to do to look at the effect of physical activity on myocardial infarction, um, let's say we're doing a cohort study. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide all the people into those who are exposed and those who are unexposed. So in a cohort study, we divide everyone into exposed and unexposed, which we've done here, and then we track and see whether um, there's a difference in the incidence of myocardial infarction as a function of the exposure. But as we know, if we have confounding variables and we do find a relationship between the exposure and the disease, the relationship may be due to the confounding variables rather than the exposure. So let's look at how at the confounding variables. So we want to look at the confounding variables as a function of exposure group, and we want to compare the frequency of the confounding variables in each of the exposure groups to see whether, they're, whether they actually are confounding variables. So this um, is kind of a visual depiction of what would be Table 1 in a uh, study paper where you have at the top here you've got the exposed group, and then... Um, at the bottom you've got the unexposed group, so these are physically active, inactive, and then looking at smoking and see how smoking breaks down as a function of exposure group. And so we know this is a cohort study, so it just happens that in the world people who are less physically active tend to smoke more than those who are physically active and physically active people have a better diet overall than uh, sedentary people, have more money, higher income, uh, and then also tend to be male. So there are more males disproportionately in the physical activity group than in the non-physical activity group. So this shows the distribution of the confounding variables across the exposure groups and so now we have to figure out what to do to control for that because obviously if we find a relationship between the exposure and the disease it could be any of these things because there are so many differences between these groups so there's the smoking difference diet income difference and 
um, sex difference. So one strategy for dealing with this is called restriction. And restriction is when you limit the inclusion criteria for the study to individuals that fall within one category of a confounding variable. So in our case, let's just um, use restriction f and um, restrict the study to only men. So that way we won't have to worry about this confounding variable. So we will only allow men in the study. So if there's only men in the study, we no longer have a confounding variable uh, of uh, gender. And so then at least we know that any relationship between the exposure and the disease in, that comes out in our study of only men um, is not confounded by gender, but then we can't generalize it to women. Another approach is called stratification, and stratification is when you look at the effect in each of the um, subgroups of the confounding variable. So in, our, in the case of gender or sex, we, we look at the exposure or disease relationship in men, and then we look separately at that relationship in women. And that way we can be sure that... Um, you know, we're eliminating the confounding variable. We get a relative risk in each of these subgroups. The limitation of stratification is that there are usually many potential confounding variables. So we saw before that we had income and diet and smoking, and so it's likely that those confounding variables still exist within each of these levels of stratification. And so usually there are not enough observations in the study to stratify on all levels of the potential confounding variables. So you have to pick the most important confounding variables to use stratification. And then you still have to deal with the remaining confounding variables within your levels of stratification. So the strategies we just discussed will work in a cohort study, but not necessarily in a case control study. So remember that a case control study, we start with cases. We have a set of individuals who've had a, an MI, and then um, we're looking for, to see how many of them are physically active. And we need to develop a control group in which we can compare the number of physically active people to the uh, number in the cases. And so what happens is the cases have a set of um, characteristics. So imagine that these are the characteristics of the cases. So there's, um, you know, some people who have a high income, but mostly not. There's a lot of men, um, some, you know, healthy, some not, and then some smoking. And so what you want to do with the control group in a case control study is you want the control group to match the case group as much as possible on these potential confounding variables. So as best as possible you try to match the controls so that they have the same they don't differ so you don't create variables that um, confound the relationship between the disease and the exposure in a case control study. But obviously this is really tricky to do and so that's why one of the limitations of the case control study. So probably the best way of dealing with confounding variables is randomization. So um, let's say that you have a, you want to look at the relationship between physical activity and myocardial infarction and you're going to do a randomized controlled trial. So what you do is you start with a group of people, again, who are really varied. So in, in this one, you're going to include both men and women. And um, you wouldn't include people who are really physically active because you want to control the exposure. So you're going to do a physical activity intervention on half of the participants. So you want to include people who are sedentary to start with. And so, yeah, they vary on all these, these characteristics, again. And so what you're going to do is you're going to randomize these people. So each person, you flip a coin, or it's not really flipping a coin, but you 
randomly assign them to one of two groups, either the intervention group or the control group. So you take people from this original pool of participants, all of whom are um, physically inactive, you randomize them into the intervention and control group. And then what is that that process of randomization should equalize the confounding variables across groups. And so that's the whole purpose of randomization, is that you want to make sure that both of your groups, that there's no confounding differences between the groups. And the reason, as we saw before, that randomization is so helpful in that is because these things tend to f cluster together. So you may have over here, you know, um, you know, maybe men make more money than women, so there's a correlation here. But that is not different across the groups because there's equal numbers of men in both groups. So the other benefit to randomization is it controls for variables that are confounding that you're not even aware of. And so that's a critical factor. So with those unknown confounding variables, and of course these things exist, um, you, when you randomize, you make sure, ideally, that those unknown variables are also distributed evenly across the groups. So that's the magic of randomization. Now, of course, it doesn't always work, so you always have to test randomization, but usually it works pretty well. But you, and you can always look in a paper and make sure that the groups are equal across um, uh, that there's no confounding variables between the intervention and control group. Okay, so you start and then you've got these groups that are equivalent um, in terms of the the other variables that um, differ across uh, the individuals, so no confounding variables. Then you intervene and then you create this situation, which is the ideal situation for a study, where you now have these two groups differing only in the exposure because you have controlled the exposure. So you've turned these people who are sedentary using your intervention, you have turned them into physically active people. And so now when you compare the intervention group with the control group, you don't have anything that confounds that difference. Um, I mean, that's the ideal situation. Um, of course, there are dropout biases and things like that that we've discussed but this is why you have to use intent to treat analysis because the whole point of a randomized controlled trial is that you're balancing the confounding variables across groups. So you're eliminating confounding variables in the randomization. So if then what you do is you only analyze the people who finished the study, you may get a situation where all the men drop out okay, of the intervention and not of the control group. And so then at the end when you're analyzing this study, you no longer have a, an equivalence across the groups. You have reintroduced confounding variables over the course of the study. So that's why you have to use intent to treat analysis and you have to be very aware of dropout in a randomized controlled trial. But overall, this is why randomization RCTs are considered such a great form of evidence for a hy study hypothesis because they do um, the best job of controlling for confounding variables.